This evening is part of a series of monthly events called The Upgrade. So welcome to The Upgrade. Tonight, we're collaborating with the World Science Festival. A little over a month ago, we got the news that Steve Kurtz's case had been dismissed. We proposed that actually talking with Steve and having him as a guest at IBEAM uh, would be the ideal way to kick off this kind of a conversation. The last time he spoke here, he had Lucia Sommer talking with him, because Lucia is the coordinator of the Critical Art Ensemble Defence Fund, the CAE Defence Fund. Um, and tonight, Steve's able to speak without that kind of support for the first time in four years, so we're really excited about that. So I'm going to ha hand over to Carl Zimmer. Carl Zimmer is a journalist and a science writer, and uh, he will introduce the panellists for this evening and moderate the discussion with Steve, Eugene Thacker, and George Annis, uh, but he'll do a better job than me of introduction, so over to you. Tonight we're going to talk about um, a really remarkable story, um, basically the past four years of Steve Kurtz's life. Um, it's a story that brings together art and biology and terrorism and uh, a lot of issues we, we grapple with uh, in what we hope is a free society in a post 9-11 world. Um, before we kick into this, let me just um, introduce you to uh, Steve and to everyone else who's here. So Steve Kurtz is a uh, co-founder of the multi-award winning art and theater collective, Critical Art Ensemble, an organization that performs a, uh, and exhibits art about information, communication, and biotechnologies. He's also a professor of visual studies at SUNY at Buffalo. Uh, next to Steve is Eugene Thacker. Eugene is the author of several books and articles that combine philosophy, science, and technology, including Biomedia, The Global Genome, and The Exploit, A Theory of Networks, which he co-authored with Alexander Galloway. He has collaborated with art collectives, biotech hobbyist, and radical software group. And next to Eugene is George Annis. Uh, George is the author or editor of 17 books on health law and bioethics, and is co-founder of the Global Lawyers and, uh, and Physicians, an organization that promotes human rights and health he is the Edward R. Udley Professor and Chair of the Department of Health, Law, Bioethics, and Human Rights of Boston University School of Public Health. And again, my name is Carl Zimmer. I'm a journalist. I also write books. My most recent book is called Microcosm. It's about E. coli. Um, so I was very excited to hear that one of uh, Steve's uh, works involves E. coli. Um, but uh, Steve, why don't we uh, just start, for those who might not be familiar, with what's happened to you, but just telling us what happened uh, one morning in May 2004. Oh, a very, very dark time. Um, and also just to say thank you all for coming out and also for all of you, and I know because I can see bunches of you that have been supporting this case for four years and have kind of been along for the ride with me. <clears throat> thank you, it's done and you know, and we don't get to say this very much in these dark days of the Bush administration, but we won this round. So let's hope we can keep that kind of thing going in the upcoming months. Uh, this is really the first time for me to really be able to, to, especially what I'm about to talk about now, I could never talk about before. You know, as Amanda said, Lucia Summer always had to talk about this for me. So I finally get to say it, and I have to say it's a little um, anxiety provoking to, uh, for the words to have to come out myself in, this, in a public sphere because it's very difficult to get the idea that the FBI is watching out of your system and that there won't be some consequence if you, you know, start t talking about these narratives that I've had to remain gagged on for so long. So uh, what happened, it was, it was actually in, in the morning, I woke up to find that my wife of 20 years, partner of 27 years, uh, had died um, quite tragically, and as we found out, it was of heart failure. And uh, after kind of initial panic and shock, I made my way to the phone to dial 911 and, you know, said, I believe my wife has died and, you know, was quite hysterical and out, out came the emergency units and they showed up. Now, the, what happened next was, uh, you know, I'm, I'm pretty forgiving about. But uh, the emergency unit, when they see a woman, in, in this case who is only 45 years old, who has died, it 
look strange to them and it's something that maybe that warrants investigation. So they of course call the police right away and the detectives, three detectives come out and are wandering all about my house. And I come to realize fairly quickly that you know, they're going to do their job. They're, they're not going to take any prisoners and whether my wife had just died or not, they really didn't care. They were there to see if there was gonna be a crime and um, they were going to do whatever interrogation had to happen to see if there is grounds for a crime. So primarily then they were interrogating me about murder and, and where they got that idea was having seen my lab. Now, I, you know, I had a very simple home lab, a very simple micro, uh, molecular biology lab, and uh, for whatever reason, the police and the FBI concurred with this idea that it seemed more reasonable to them that I was doing something nefarious um, than it was that I was a professor that specialized in the intersection of art and science, and therefore I had the tools of that trade. Uh, they thought, well, I don't know if we can buy that, and especially in these times, you're probably something else. And so after a, a long afternoon of um, interrogation, the detectives decided they had had enough, and I certainly had. And on the way out, they informed me that they were of the belief the FBI is going to need to talk to me. And I was like, oh, that's bad news. But it, it, it didn't register perhaps to the extent that it probably should have, because what they were telling me is, we're turning you into the FBI now. And so the next day as I left my home to go to make arrangements for Hope's funeral, to go to the funeral home, uh, you know, four cars full of FBI agents came screeching up in front of me and they basically put me into a soft detention, right? I was rendered, basically I was kind of kidnapped, although in a nice way, right? You know, the kind of, I, it wasn't the kind where they drug you and put you in the plane and, you know, send you on the torture taxi to some godforsaken place. Um, for me, it was, I was, I was taken to the Hyatt. <laughs> and, 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 that's, and that's where I would spend my time while they, you know, interrogated me. And, um, I, you know, I tried to, tried to find out what they could. And it was, it was a, it was a re this was a really weird experience for those of you that, that may feel, sa feel safe because the FBI bioterrorism unit. Well, when I first went to meet them, and it was led by the Joint Terrorist Task Force, and they brought me out of my hotel room into the other hotel room that they had for interrogation, um, I, I knew it was going to be trouble right away because the head of this operation, what's he doing while waiting for me to come in? He's reading the Bible. I was like, oh man, oh man, <laughs> and um, so he, he sits me down and, you know, and, and, and we're talking and, and, you know, I just said, uh, you know, the lab, I don't know, why, why would it possibly be bothering you? I mean, you know what this is, it's basic equipment, it's a centrifuge, a little tiny one, and PCR, and electrophoresis, a little tiny electrophoresis apparatus, it's a, you know, what? What on earth can be it? He's like, look, I don't know about these newfangled things like this. I was like, you're the head of bioterrorism and you don't know what any of this are? He's like, no. <laughs> I, was like, I was like, oh, this day is going to go really bad. And, and sure enough, it did. They decided that they needed to pack me up and take me down to FBI headquarters, still uncharged, still not Mirandized. And down to FBI headquarters I went when finally, uh, uh, Mike from the Yes Men, Mike, if you're, I don't know if you're here or not tonight, uh, found me, <laughs> called the ACLU and found me a lawyer, my, who became my lawyer, Paul Cambria, uh, 